is Miguel Zicat. And um, Miguel is the only person that I know professionally who I have also heard a voice actor do in an audiobook. That's crazy. Like, how did that That's great. I know that you're a character in, in a couple of games, but now also now, someone did your voice, which is, yeah. which is weird. Um, I'm in fact my voice actor. Miguel could not come today, so I just brought the voice actor. <laughs> so Miguel is um, a philosopher by trade and training, and uh, this, I think we can say that he's one of the guys who started up game studies or, and game research as a field in Denmark coming here at, to the IT University. Um, he started out working in uh, on the ethics of games and gaming and that, when I read your abstract for today, I can see that's still heavily part of your thinking about what playfulness and gamefulness and all these different things are. Um, Miguel um, writes in his um, introduction that that he has some reservations about our way of uh, trying to make machines playful because as he, say, he says at some point maybe we end up having machines controlling humans instead of the other way around. Um, and that concerns me too a lot so I'm looking forward to hearing the long form argument of that. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, so. Um, this is going to be fun or interesting because the thing, the thing that I always do, not always, but these days I do is that I, I you know, somebody uh, generously invites me to say, like, could you say something about these things that you've written in the past? And then I say, I've just had this idea. I don't know how it works, but I'm going to talk in front of people until I figure it out. So that's my method. My, old, my whole academic method is right now I'm going to present ideas that are half-baked and hopefully collaboratively we're going to finish baking them. I, you will be credited, 5% distributed. <laughs> I have to pay my agent. No, anyway, so, um, so I'm going to be talking today about the, the notion of playing an automated world. And this is something that concerns me a lot, because I've been doing uh, work in, on play for quite a while. As, uh, I published this book called Play Matters uh, a few years back. It's now out on paperbacks. Um, so I started in game studies, and, and back in 2002, 2003, I sort of, you know, started working on studying uh, video games from a humanistic point of view. And about around 2010, I realized that I was actually tired of video games per se, and that I, I was much more interested in this notion of play and playfulness. And I think I was lucky to ride a wave. I think there was a, there was a moment around 2010, 2011, where the study of play really caught traction. I mean, we've been studying play for a long time, right? But, but the study of play really caught traction. And there were more and more, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a bigger focus on uh, how to do playful things outside of games. It was great. Um, gamification was one of those trends, but also there's, there's plenty of, of examples that you've been, uh, you're very familiar with. Um, so I think this book was my kind of contribution to to that conversation, very game studies oriented still, but sort of trying to, as one reviewer said, troll uh, game studies. It's a, it's a good description. Um, and now, uh, for the last couple of years, not only have I been doing sort of research on uh, computation and play, which is part of what I'm going to be presenting today, but I've also been doing consultancy for companies who are interested in um, making their services more playful. And that's where I said, you know, I got contacted, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a humanist, so like people are interested in my knowledge, I immediately get excited, because that, that doesn't happen. Um, and I started collaborating with these companies, and I, I, you know, lately I've been, I've been thinking a little bit, what am I actually doing? Right? And, and what are we doing with this whole play movement? So, so today I want to, I want to sort of um, take this opportunity to so at least I need to publicly take it easy, take a deep breath, think about what I'm doing, think about what it means to do the kind of playful design thinking that I do. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that break in public. Uh, and I do come in peace. <laughs> and that's, so that's really important. This, this has nothing to do with nobody else's work but my work. I'm going to be talking about we, but it's a, it's a majestatic we, it's a plural we. It's like when I say we, I mean I. 
Uh, <laughs> yes, yes so, so you don't think that I'm here to sort of like, oh, you know, attacking everybody else's research. I have a, I have a reputation, uh, and I, it's all bad reputation. Uh, but <laughs> I've never done it, but this is really about me rethinking my work through, right? Um, and, and especially sort of walking you through a little bit the, this, this hesitation and this concern that I have. So I do come in peace, but we're going to be talking uh, today a little bit about the, the notion of, of living in a brave new world, about automation, which is something that concerns me quite a lot, uh, and, and, and the role that play has in all these things. So, let's just start. I, I think I'm, you know, the world is great, so everything is great and nobody's happy, right? Um, and the world, the, world is, the world is great, but at the same time, I think we are, we are sort of cheerfully, gleefully, I know, I know that we don't have many reasons to be cheerful and gleeful these days, but we are, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, we are actually embracing a model of society, not on the upper political level, but on the day-to-day -day life, in which computers have a bigger role to play. And we do so for the sake of, of comfort, of, 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 of practical needs, of efficiency, of uh, how, how computers sort of insert themselves in our lives and may, they make everything just so much easier. You know, I have to buy a plane ticket so I can do it from my phone. I can do everything from my phone. And to me, that, that world, which is lovely, and I, I would not trade it for anything, but we are walking uh, lemmings-like towards a dystopia in which this fake um, screenshot might actually end up being uh, true, right? Microtransactions applied to home surveillance and social shame. We are embracing a model of ubiquitous computing, and particularly automated ubiquitous computing, that I find very worse. I am an ethicist, I'm a philosopher by trade, I'm, I'm deeply invested in human agency, I'm, a, I'm an anthropocentric philosopher, super old-fashioned. Um, and I'm, I'm just really concerned about the role, that we, the, the role that machines play in our world, and the kind of delegation that uh, we are... We are um, giving to machines, right? What, what are we delegating to machines? And this comes, uh, right now, uh, it's, it's very hot around the concept of automation. Right? So automation is one of the biggest threats uh, that, that sort of post-capitalist society is inflicting on itself. And we, let's face it, honestly, if we survive to global warming, uh, automation is going to be a big deal. I'm not afraid of AI, because I use my phone to send messages often, and the autocorrect shows me that we are far away from Skype. <laughs> but I am, I am very concerned about automation. And I know when, you, when I say automation, you're thinking about robots, right? No, like robots are like the autocorrect of technology. <laughs> They're great, except they are. I am really not worried about automation in the shape of robots. The robots have been great, they have actually sort of improved work life in, in places that were historically terrible, like factory floors. Of course they have eliminated jobs, but, but the, the jobs that, that remain are actually much more humane, thanks to machines. So I'm not afraid of robots, I'm afraid of, of, a, of a more evil, less visible type of automation. It's easy to be, to be afraid of these machines, right? It's easy to see these these robots that Boston Dynamics makes that it's, you know, can do somersaults and can run faster than humans. I think, like, oh, that's super scary. <laughs> the automation I'm afraid of is this one. I'm super afraid of things like Uber or uh, Airbnb or even more smaller, tinier, and more insidious forms of what I've been calling lately soft automation, which is the use of algorithms to leverage ubiquitous computing to eliminate or to facilitate uh, some services, eliminating uh, uh, sort of um, specific uh, specialized users and turning what used to be services into self-service. Who has gone to a total agent lately? Who, I mean, taxi drivers, they not, I mean, you should oppose Uber, not only because Uber, but also because they, they you know, they eliminate a not very well functioning True, it's not a very well functioning sort of uh, uh, a guild like uh, labor, but still, there's still an organization, there's still a regulation. But 
we become our own dispatchers, we become our own travel agents, we become our own bank tellers, we become our own everything. This is soft automation, and this is the one that I'm deeply concerned with. Because I don't work with robots, I've tried to make robots playful, we didn't really cooperate. But I do work with companies that are really invested in this type of automation. Let's leverage machine learning so we can optimize customer-facing services. That essentially means we're going to cut a thousand jobs in the next year. And maybe that those are jobs that need to be cut. I don't know, but it's problematic. It's problematic on a labor wise, on a labor perspective. I mean, it's deeply problematic on, uh, um, I think, also from a general ontological point of view. And the worst thing is that, let's face it, I think we may have a problem. We as in, <laughs> we as in me, and we as in, <laughs> we as in all of us interested in playful design, right? Because that's what we are facilitating. What we are facilitating as playful designers is that kind of dystopia. Uh, we are facilitating this type of uh, uh, soft automation. Because there's an, in, there's an inherent uh, learning problem, there's an inherent engagement problem with these self-services. And companies are looking for people who know a little bit about things like engagement, things like motivation, things like pleasure, and that's us. And it's super exciting, right? Because, yay, we get to you know, make the world more playful. At what price? To me, it all starts by going back to the question, why do we want to play the world? <laughs> why is it that it's so... Why are we so invested in making the world more playful? Why do we want to put play everywhere? Why do we, want, why do we think that play matters and it should be a, a, a mode of engaging with everything? What, what's, what's, that make, what, what's the thing that makes play so interesting? So, I, in order to do this kind of uh, um, yeah, conscious cleansing that I'm doing here, uh, uh, I, I wanted to go back to like, what, why did I start thinking um, that play is interesting as a way of engaging with the world? So, classic play theory and contemporary play studies um, say that, that sort of, basically a state that play is really good at engaging users and, and facilitating a number of emotional uh, and uh, intellectual behaviors and relations with the world that we can then leverage for other purposes. So we want to play the world because if we play, we increase our motivation. We've, we've heard this before, right? And, and that, that makes a lot of sense. When the logic goes, you know, we, we play games and we don't mind using 170 hours to, you know, whatever, become better at um, scoring penalties in FIFA. I have done that. <laughs> um, because we are motivated. So what if we could take this motivation from play, channel through games, and apply it in the real world? And that's when we start having sort of the classic uh, gamification approach, right? right? Let's try to see how games structure motivational uh, rewards and see if we can affect behavioral change <coughs> in the way we uh, perform tasks that are not game mediated. So let's try to take this technology of play out of the equation and see how much we can keep from uh, play. And I think maybe that's, you cannot, hopefully you can already hear that I, there's something about re removing the technology of play that I find problematic, right? Because games is something that we've historically designed it's the, it's the, for playing, it's the, it's the pinnacle of the technologies of play. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of toys particularly, but um, that's a matter of discussion, but uh, what happens when, when we try to make everything following the steps of the objects that we've historically designed to facilitate play? To me, that, that, that's already, so it makes me hesitate. But I see the logic. Wouldn't it be great if we were motivated to do things that are boring like we are motivated to uh, play games? Makes sense. Reason number one as to why we want to play the world. Reason number two, creativity. 
when we play, we tend to be extremely creative. We tend to be creative. Let me just, you know, I'm, I'm Spanish. I like this sort of extremely uh, moving my arms and everything is like huge. But, but it's more like we tend to be, play, play tend to, tends to afford creativity, right? Um, for a number of reasons, I'm going to talk about those reasons uh, uh, later on, but um, in more depth, but, but the main reason why uh, I think play affords creativity is the fact that play is um, autotelic and happens in a bounded uh, setting. We lower the risks, we enhance uh, people's uh, uh, engagement with uh, creative uh, solution thinking for the sake of finding a solution, not for any uh, other goal, because if it was for another goal, we could have a performance anxiety. So we bound a particular situation, we separate it from the real world, you know, not totally separated, but we kind of like pull it a little bit apart, we give it its own purpose, we make it out of the lake, creativity starts appearing. I don't think I've ever seen anybody play a video game or any kind of game without being creative. Playing is to me an act of creativity. That's, that's, how, we, that's how we play. So I, I'm, I'm totally uh, on board with this, and of course I would like the world, I would like to, to sort of be able to engage with the world with the kind of creative terms that, that technologies of play allows, right? And, and sort of mediate things like complicated math learning through the sort of joyful <coughs> creativity of play. I'm all for that. And that's why I think this is reason number two, why I wanted to make uh, the world more play. And, and argument number three as to why the world, uh, or I wanted to make the world more playful and put play everywhere, uh, is the F word. Which I don't know what it means, so don't ask me. And when I teach, my students are not allowed to use this word. I actually have them totally terrified. Every time they say fun, they just like look like, oh no, I'm going to flunk. Because I don't know what fun means, right? I, I have no idea. Um, it's a slippery concept. Every, every time you try to define fun, something, something just uh, escapes through your fingers. But we, we all have a feeling that when we play, there's a certain joy that, that we have that happens through the engagement with this encapsulated, autotelic universe, autotelic world. Uh, and that's why we keep on doing that activity, because it is fun. So wouldn't it be nice if the world was fun. So creativity and uh, engagement and fun and all of these things that play gives us. This is why I wanted to make uh, uh, the world more playable and that's why I thought wouldn't it be great now that we are putting computers everywhere to make the, the, the interaction with these computers more playful because we know how to do that, right? Video games have been doing that for the last 40 years Interaction designers have been doing the same for almost the same amount of time, so we know how to make creative, fun interactions with machines. And that's where I start thinking, okay, maybe I actually have a problem with play. So don't tell anybody, because I'm, I'm kind of trying to sell myself these days as a play scholar. And I'm saying, I may have a tiny problem with play. Uh, and and, and it's, a, it's a terrible contradiction. It's, a, it's not... I don't know how to deal with it. I, I, wish I, could, I, I wish I could give you any answers, but I do have a problem with play. And the problem with play is that on paper, everything sounds great. And when I start to scratch the surface, when I start to ask the complicated questions that I like to ask myself about my own practices, about my own... Uh, thinking, I'm not happy with the results. So, play has very many positive things. Outcomes. And if we are outcome oriented, we can have a creative, engaging, fun world. Yeah. We are all very motivated to engage with these activities. But why? So the reason is because we play them. But what does it mean to play the world? So let's go back to what play is, or what play does, which is much more interesting. So there's many ways of, of structuring what play is, and you know, uh, play theorists have been discussing about what, what the, the nature of play for uh, uh, thousands of years. Uh, and in the Western world, we have it's, it's a hot topic in the 20th century. So what is play? Uh, so I'm going to give you the simplified one-slide understanding of my my 
my current definition of play as to why it is problematic. So, when we play, we create worlds that impose an order in the world. And I know that these worlds and world, it's complicated. Um, phenomenologically speaking, what I would say, or post-phenomenologically speaking, what I would say is that play is an orientation of experience. It's a way of orienting our experience of the world, so it has a, a, so we, 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 we experience it in a particular way, and that world that is experienced is a world that it's created. It's a form of mediation of, ex, of, of the world, and it's a form, form of orientation of experience. Um, in, in, in a summary, it's like basically, uh, uh, when we play, we find order, we, we uh, uh, create and, and assemble a number of rules that generate an order. When that order is created, a world emerges. And that's the world in which we play. And it's a world that has the classic characteristics of play. It's uh, autotelic, it's bound, uh, the results are not necessarily material, <coughs> all these things that we do. But that's what we do with play, right? I think. That's the, that's the reason why we want to play everything, because the world is chaotic, and play gives us a world, a way of arranging the world through order. Through order that gives us agency, because that's the key of play, shifting the agency uh, way to the player. What else does performs this operation in the world? What have computers ever done for us? <coughs> Computers arrange the world based on rules that they have to follow in order to gain agency in the world. That's what computation does. Computation, in the sense I'm going to, to work through today, is the creation of worlds through the, let's call it, algorithmic order. The order of computable processes that, that happen in that world and that, crucially, give computers Agents. So on the one hand, we have play creating worlds for human agency, and on the other hand, we have computers creating worlds in which they have agency. What do I mean exactly by this? Because I know that this can be sort of a little bit rough. My favorite video of this week. Um, you probably have no idea what this is, right? This is an alien intelligence. It's high frequency trading algorithms operating. This is this is hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, right? And every, every arrow you see moving there is a transaction in real time of BlackBerry stock. Um, we live with aliens. That's an alien intelligence over there. And so the, so, the, so the interesting thing to me is that I live in the same world as these high frequency trading algorithms. And I live in, in a world in which the stock market, the stakeholders, they have a huge say on my day-to-day -day life. They decide, the stockholders, whoever that mythical creature is, with that one horn and half <laughs> lion and half horse, or whatever they are. But the stockholders close companies, shut down services, promote other things, you know, pollute the world or don't pollute the world, based on market results, markets in which we are not the only agent. We have agents that operate on milliseconds and affect our own agents. This is what I mean by computers creating world. In a world in which we can have high frequency trading algorithms, we are not alone anymore, and we are in that world. We live in the world of these computers. We live in the world of these computational agencies. And we cannot, we cannot really, we just cannot really avoid it. That's the world in which, that's the world we have to make Playful. That's a world we want to make playful. It's a world in which computers are not just mediating machines, they are agents. And they are not just in the world, they create the world. My other favorite example, which I talk about all the time, and I love it, running applications. I used to run, I cannot run anymore, uh, but I used to run a lot, and I used to use all these kind of services to run, right? Um, so, and, you know, um, having to stop running, they made, I've, I've been thinking a lot about these, these services, and, and I realized that what these services do is they, they give us 
a nice computer-based world in which our fitness activity can happen. Um, I've been tinkering for a while now with how um, iPhones measure uh, steps. And it's super interesting because you can think that, you know, uh, the iPhone is totally all the time counting your steps unless you are clever enough to sort of turn off that thing. Um, so the way that the iPhone counts the steps is not your human step, right? It detects a number of uh, differences in the accelerometer gyroscope data. It's actually sort of a, a data fusion of several sensors. And then they are run by, in modern phones, by a coprocessor that has a statistics. So your step is kind of measured around all the other users' steps. And if it looks like a step, also based on what other people call a step, then you have taken a step. So this might not be a step. So your step for a phone is like an, a computational aggregate of what, it can, of what it can calculate, the kind of data that the sensors pull through, and what other people have been doing. The world has changed. And we gleefully join that world and say, like, yes, I ran five kilometers. Not five kilometers, but the five kilometers of my phone, which is a multitude. Right? We carry multitudes in our pockets, which is really beautiful and really creepy. Uh, this process in uh, philosophy of information is called reontologization. The fact that computational technologies have an effect in the world that reshapes the world and gives agency beyond biological agency. Um, there's other ways of seeing non-human agency, like the network theory, uh, the kind of post-humanism that, that Karim Bada uh, so, 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 uh, writes about. So there's a lot of ways of, of seeing. I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in this concept of reontologization because I can work through it from the perspective of play. So my take on, on computational agency is that this is what computers do in the world. They reontologize the world. They create a world in which computers are also agents. And that world is alien. It's a complicated world for us to engage with. When I showed you, we don't have, typically we don't have access to high frequency trading algorithms, right? We don't see them in real life. And when we see a video of them happening, it's, it's mind blowing. It's like, what's going on there? So, um, other things like the, the fact that we, we, we want to give, uh, um, this kind of portable computer agents in the world so they can help us perform several actions, also leverages this capacity of computers to reontologize the world and gain agents in the world. But how the main problem is an interaction problem. How do we deal with the fact that computers are now agents in our world? Well, that's where I think our problems start, because we are using play as an interface. Play is not in my opinion, exclusively uh, deployed in, in playful design for the emotional rewards of play, but also to make understandable the fact that computers are also agents in this world. Um, we use play to interface with a world of human-machine hybrid. And I think that's, that's the, that's that's where my, the heart of my problem is. That's, that's where my, my concern with play is. That we've been doing this for the sake of the results without thinking that actually what we are doing is facilitating a particular type of agency that comes with a particular type of, of technologies, that comes with a particular type of politics, that comes with a particular type of economics. And we're using play as, a, as an interface to facilitate the engagement with these alien creatures that are operating in our world. And that is, to me, the, the heart of, of the problem. Play as an interface. That is where I think I need to stop doing what I do and taking a, quite, a, quite a break and you know, not write anymore and think a little bit more. Because I, I, I think, to me, there's two vectors, there's two, there's two main problems that I, I need to address that I would like to um, introduce briefly now that happen in my work, when I start thinking about play um, as an interface to a computational world. So this, the problem number one, which I've been hinting at, not hinting, talking about, is computational labor. This deployment of computational agents in the world is technically eroding a large number of, work, of, of jobs. Um, it's eroding also the, the, the very nation of labor, 
translating uh, uh, or, or, or bringing productivity requirements everywhere. Nobody takes a weekend, nobody takes uh, a break, everybody's freelance because now there's no, there's no middlemen. And to me, this is problematic because we are, as play designers, we are interfacing with uh, the destruction of a very particular type of jobs. And it's not, it's not blue collar jobs, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, of jobs that were required not long education, but require a certain education that was accessible for a vast number of people and that facilitated and, 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 and consolidated a middle class. And we are moving away from that and we are gleefully enjoying the opportunities of playing the disappearing jobs. I, I want to, to I've, been, I've been working on, on sort of making self-service systems for banks more playful and therefore eliminating bank, bank teller jobs. I, I have been complicit with the disappearing jobs because that's what we do when we engage with playful services. We engage sometimes with disappearing jobs and we like it, which is the worst thing, right? <laughs> we are leveraging, we are using play as an interface to enjoy this destruction of labor. And that is that's deeply problematic, and I think that's something that we, at least I, need to address and think about uh, thoroughly. But wait, there's more, because <laughs> you know we. I cannot be. I cannot leave you sort of this cheerful. I still think that some of you are, some of you are still optimistic. Uh, let's go back to the notion of, of, or one of the key characteristics of play: the autotelic nature of play, or the fact that play is an activity that it's driven by its own purpose. So, uh, in my tradition of play studies, which is the, the sort of philosophy, uh, humanistic oriented uh, tradition that Heusinger most recently started, but Heusinger, as everybody knows, uh, was basically just channeling German Romanticism and particularly uh, Schiller's reading of Kant and particularly Schiller's reading of the Third Critique. And I know that there's a lot of Kantian people in the room that we are going to engage in a proper conversation about that. <laughs> Let's keep that for the coffee. Um, <laughs> Autotelic is the way we have been defining play historically. And it's, it's about the fact that play is an activity that has its own purpose, separated, and it doesn't produce material results. And that's why it's so pleasurable. At least in the humanities side of, of play studies, this concept is capital. This concept articulates why play is so interesting. It's an, uh, it's a, it's an activity separated of purpose and and, and productivity. That's why it's so connected with aesthetics, that's why it's so, it's so connected with the emotional side, with the, supl the sublime and so on. And this is, this is great, right? Because it allows us uh, to understand why when we play a game we are so deeply embedded and deeply emotionally attached to the goals of the game, even though the goals of the game are ridiculously absurd. Like how can I, how, how can I weep? when a ball crosses a, a, a line in football. But I do it anyway. Because in that, in that instance, that's the most important thing in the world, because play is how to tell it. Uh, play defines its own purpose. And we cannot avoid the fact that play always will have this kind of autotelic nature. So my problem with the notion of autotelic is that we are not discussing it deep enough. Because when we try to create playful interactions outside the technologies of play, outside the technologies that consciously and culturally say, hey, we are playing, this has its own purpose, we are separate. When we are trying to put it into other domains, what we are bringing in is also the capacity that play has to separate things, to be able to define its own needs. And therefore, I'm afraid that sometimes when we are trying to um, design for playful experiences, we end up performing a triple decoupling. By doing playful design, I fear, and I'm not, I don't have any data, but this is kind of the ethicist in me saying, wait, we should think about these things. We may be decoupling action from consequence. Because it's just so pleasurable to do these things. It's so playful. It's so nice. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's great. We lose the perspective of, of the whole network of, of things that we are engaged with when we interact with a particular computer. We are also decoupling from the validity of rules. Um, 
at some time, I've been talking about it for so long now, but at some moment I'm going to sit down and I'm going to finally <coughs> write my argument as to why, why fake news and trolling are manifestations of play that are deeply based on our reluctance culturally to discuss the autotelic nature of play. Because when something is again, we can discuss the rules, because these are not like socially binding rules. They are binding in this encounter, but they don't, you know, they don't propagate outside this encounter. What happens when the encounter is larger in society? What happens when some people are playing and some people are not? What happens when we decouple rules that are out there because we want everything to be more playful, we want everything to be more uh, fun? And we are also decoupling ourselves from worlds. We are, I think, by, by doing playful design, we have the risk of decoupling the small contained interactions from the worlds in which those interactions take place. And we can have terrible, absolutely hideous examples, like the following screenshot, which is real. This is uh, somebody trying to uh, talk playfully to uh, one of these uh, chatbots, right? <laughs> Except it is no fucking chatbot. It's a low minimum wage job of somebody doing it. <laughs> there is no Alexa. There's just people on the other side, right? And to me, that's that's the main problem, right? That we are we are decoupling ourselves from these worlds that are complicated that we need to engage with, um, and it. It sucks, because we try to do it because it's fun uh, and pleasurable, and wouldn't it be great to play everything? Yes, but it comes at a price, a price that at least I have not been willing to negotiate uh, so far. So I want to finish in this kind of gloomy mode. Um, so I want to come up with at least, so give you some alternatives, or at least uh, give you a glimpse of um, what I'm working on now. <laughs> As you can see, I'm not very optimistic these days. Um, <laughs> So, I think there's one possibility. Um, if we think about play and its history, and particularly the history of the concept of play in the 20th century, um, and how it relates with aesthetics, I think we can use play to, as I, as I want to call it now, to reclaim automated futures. When we play, we can redefine the context of the world in our own terms, more or less. Or at least we can try to impose our own terms in the world. We don't need to play by the rules of the computer, we don't need to play by the rules of, of the machine, we don't need to play by the rules, we can define the rules. We can negotiate the rules, we can discuss them. And that's what I mean, if we go back to what we actually do when we play, if we go back to the notion of autotelling that fuel not uh, um, games, but the kind of art that Dada and surrealism was, were, were engaging with, this kind of slightly terroristic, slightly of uh, anarchistic, destructive, uh, uh, engaging with, with, with play and with the world, then I think uh, we have something to do. But of course I know what you're thinking, like, that sounds great, what a nice slogan, but it means nothing, right? We claim automated futures. <laughs> How do we do it, right? Uh, okay, so I have a program, I have a plan, I know how I'm trying to, going to, so going to, to address my own contradictions. And it's a, it's a four steps plan, and I don't know how long I'm, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. But this is, this is my solution um, to this problem of play. Um, the first one is, I think we need a, a new rhetoric of play. So I'm, I'm deeply invested in the way uh, Brian Sutton Smith framed the study of play, as you can sort of find different rhetorics that allow you to see the effect of culture, or the effect of playing culture, and the role of playing culture in different ways, right? Um, I think most of the models from the 20th century are not operative anymore, because we live in a human-machine hybrid uh, world, uh, in a world of information, so we need a rhetoric that works us through that. It's not an isolated rhetoric, it will work with all the other rhetorics, the progress, the, the, the rhetoric of imagination, but we need to specify what does it mean to play when there's non-human agents modifying and engaging with our agency. A rhetoric of computational play. And I'm going to make this terrible exceptionalist argument saying that computers are unique technologies. Let's see how that goes. Um, I think I can defend it, but let's see how that goes. It's going to be complicated. I also think that we need to have a conversation about the ethics of all this. All this is all this. <laughs> playful design, gamification, game design, loot boxes. 
uh, all of those things, we really need to talk about what we are doing. And we really need to come up with a better model than nobody's been harmed, so it must be okay most of the time. We really need to think thoroughly. What, is, what, what role does ethics play in, the, in our design processes, in our uh, consumer processes, in our engagement with the labor market, in the, in the technologies that we put out in the world? Um, I also want to take a proper look at history because I'm pretty sure that we've been playing with computers since day one and not with video games. And I cannot prove it, but I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, Willem Flusser used to, or, or wrote that sort of computers are, are ludic machines. I think he was spot on, 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 like there's something about that correlation that it's interesting. I want to see when did this all start. And finally, I want to, I want to come up with a method, a proper method, um, for making uh, this kind of playable things. And by this, I mean conscious, ethically, ethically solid, uh, well aware of its, of its environment, things that, that are embedded or that are a consequence of this critical thinking, of this sort of questioning of what do we mean by play and playing uh, the world. So I guess I have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> but it's going to be, if nothing else, it's going to be fun. Um, or not, maybe, who knows. That's all I have to say. Thank you.